So today in this mini lecture, we're going to talk about the role of evolution through natural selection in shaping genetic differences. We'll talk about how genes and environment interact together to produce the traits that you express. This field of study is called epigenetics. Then we'll talk about ideas about heritability and how we can use mathematical measures of heritability to try to understand how genes and environment are working together. In the second part of this mini lecture, we'll talk about normal processes of neural development, and then we'll analyze some specific neural developmental disorders and looking at critical periods in development. So if we're going to talk about uh, heritability and genetics, we need to sort of understand where genetic variation comes from. And I'm sure as some of you are somewhat familiar with, um, Charles Darwin is one of the first people to have suggested that genetic variation is produced by the process of natural selection. In, in 1859, he suggested in The Origin of Species that any trait that provided some sort of reproductive advantage over others in a population would be favored by natural selection. So if I'm better at hiding in the woods, or I'm better at getting food, then I'm more likely to be able to have offspring who are going to survive or to avoid being eaten by others so that I can have more offspring. This should result in an increase in the frequency of those individuals. So if I'm better at getting food, then I'm going to be able to um, survive. I'm going to have offspring. And if I can pass on that trait to my offspring, then my offspring are going to survive. And we will begin to increase in frequency in a population. Charles Darwin suggested that there were three necessary conditions for natural selection to happen. One is the variation in a trait. Um, had to be heritable. You had to be able to pass it down to your offspring. Now he didn't understand about genetics. We didn't find that out until we rediscovered Mendel's P experiments many years later. But he did understand that you had to be able to pass on those traits to your offspring. Second, in general your population has to be growing and there has to be differential survival. Some individuals have to outcompete and be able to survive into the next generation, right? Whether that's getting food, hiding from predators, um, whatever that might be. There are some great examples of this happening in real time. Uh, this is uh, Marlene Zook. Marlene Zook is interested in what causes individuals to be more likely to survive in a population. And in fact, one of the things that she's shown is that male field crickets on the island of Kauai um, um, have differential survival based on differences in their traits. So some male crickets are more likely to survive than others. These male crickets um, produce songs, as you're familiar with, as with many cricket species, to attract females. But these songs that they make not only attract females, but they attract a parasitic fly, which lays its eggs on the singing male. And those, but there are some mutant males, actually, who do not produce a song. Now you would think, if you're a male and you're trying to attract females, not producing a song is potentially bad for you. But in fact, actually, if these parasitic flies are able to find these males, the larva will hatch and, um, in the males and kill them. So, and actually, there is some advantage for males who are able to produce a song that cannot be heard um, or that is very quiet in comparison. So, in fact, um, what you see is that these mutant males, these mute males that are very quiet, they have higher fitness than um, noisy males when the flies are present in a population. So if you're these typical males and you have noisy wings and there's no flies present, then you're very effective at being able to attract females and you have more mates. But, um, and these mutant, uh, mute males, uh, they actually don't attract very, very few females in general. But if there are flies present, these normal noisy males um, get selected against and it's only the mutant mute males that actually get to survive. So it actually does pay off to be a mute male in Kauai. So in fact, actually, this has shown some um, interesting results just within a few generations, right? Because crickets evolve so quickly um, that we can actually see this change happening. And in fact, this change is not just happening on Kauai. The parasitic fly has now spread to other Hawaiian islands. And as you might expect, male crickets on those islands have also developed a different mutation, but it also produces the same sort of muteness so they can't sing. So Darwin suggested that you needed heritable variation um, and that had to be able to pass down. What we now recognize is that, that heritable variation are differences in genes and that those genes make up your genotype, right? The genotype is just your genetic makeup of an organism that is related to a particular trait, sometimes called a phenotype, right? Your phenotype is the observable traits that an organism has. 
But in fact, your genotype is actually made up of alleles. Alleles are the different forms of a gene that you may carry. And Darwin suggested, in fact, that those different phenotypes, those different traits that you have, may actually lead to differential survival. So if you have a phenotype that allows you to hide from predators, you're more likely to survive because you're not going to get eaten. Or in the case of the crickets, um, males who don't sing have a different phenotype, and that allows them to not be found by the parasitic flies, right? So they have higher reproductive success because even though they don't produce that many offspring, they produce more than the males who sing and have died because of the parasitic fly. So reproductive success is really measured often as the number of fertile offspring that an organism leaves. There are lots of examples of this in practice. Um, I like examples from non-human animals um, because I think they're easier to come by than examples in humans at this point. So this is data from a population of garter snakes actually in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon. And, and these garter snakes actually differentiate, um, are different in their preference for slugs. So the ones that live near the inland portions um, actually don't like to eat slugs at all. all right? So these snakes, 75%, 80% of them will not eat slugs at all. You get a few individuals in these inland areas that might eat slugs. And you can imagine in inland areas of Oregon where it's dry, you don't get a lot of slugs. But in the coastal areas of Oregon, actually where it's much wetter, you're going to get more slugs. And if that's a viable food option for you, you're more likely to survive. And you can see that these garter snakes in these coastal areas, you can see that their feeding square, how many slugs they'll eat before they stop. Um, some of them are at 10, some at 9, 8, and then you get a few down here at less than that. But overall, more of the slugs actually, oops, more of the slugs like, more of the snakes like the slugs in the coastal areas than in the inland areas. So in a snake, if a snake in a coastal population showed up with some sort of mutated allele that said, oh, slugs are good, right? They don't taste disgusting, um, that that snake is going to leave more offspring, right? Because there's so many slugs in the coast. And if the reproductive success of those individuals with that allele is just 1% more than normal snakes, than snakes who don't like slugs, so they produce only 1% more offspring, um, that in 10,000 years, the coastal population would be composed almost entirely of snakes that can eat slugs. It's just a 1% difference in reproductive success, right? So tiny differences in how many offspring are being left in the population would, over a few thousand years, significantly change what's going on. Now, of course, this is a more this is a, a more mild example, but you can see from the example of the crickets that that produced a change in just a few generations, right? That didn't even take more than five years for that change to happen in crickets because the difference in reproductive success was so significant, right? If you're a noisy male, you're not leaving any offspring in comparison to the males who don't make any noise at all. Okay. Now that we understand how genetic variation exists within a population, we need to understand how those genetic variants get converted into some sort of cellular process that can then be expressed in the central nervous system. You may remember from high school biology that your DNA is wound in a double helix. Um, that DNA gets unwound and it gets transcripted into an RNA sequence, a complementary RNA sequence. That RNA sequence then has to be translated by ribosomes inside your cells, inside your neurons, um, to produce amino acids. Those amino acids then get wound together um, into a protein. That protein then gets expressed in different parts of your cells, for example, in particular parts of your neurons, like receptors or um, other uh, uh, protein-linked uh, processes. And in fact, one of the interesting things we've seen in gene expression is that um, our brains actually produce much higher rates of gene expression than we would see in other ape species, which may be related to high levels of transcription and translation and high rates of protein activity um, that keeps your cells functioning at a higher rate, and it may explain some of our increased cognitive abilities. Now, in addition, we need to understand where genetic diversity comes from. Of course, it can come from mutations that happen during replication. Um, and there are two common errors that pop in. One is a copper nu copy number variation, or CNV. This is where you get a variable number of gene repeats. Um, what this means is in these really long genes, um, there are sections that tell um, how many times that gene should be turned on. Right? So when it gets activated, should it be activated once? 
10 times, 100 times. And in fact, we know that more gene repeats is related to differences in certain phenotypes. For example, Huntington's disease is a motor disorder. It eventually does lead to death. It is strongly genetic. Um, it has 100%, um, it's strongly genetic. And um, people who have faster progression of Huntington's disease have a higher number of gene repeats um, than people with slower progression. Another source of mutations are single nucleotide polymorphisms, where you have just one change in a nucleotide of your DNA sequence that causes a variation in a single gene, which then causes the protein to be folded differently. Now again, lots of single nucleotide polymorphisms don't cause any change in the protein folding itself, but every once in a while, they can cause significant changes in how a receptor works, for example. For, and here's a good example. This is from Alzheimer's disease. This is a single nucleotide polymorphism in uh, the codons, and this causes the amino acid to instead be expressed as arginine instead of cysteine. And if you have what's called the E4 variant of this, so you, you get an arginine amino acid instead of a cysteine, um, you actually are more likely to develop um, Alzheimer's disease. You have about a 91% chance of developing um, Alzheimer's, and you'll have an earlier onset. Um, so your onset is about 68 years of age. One of the other ways, before we had the current technology of understanding genetics um, by looking at particular single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, a lot of what we did was trying to estimate what's the relationship between variation in a trait um, and how much of that is related to variation in genetics. We call those measures heritability. Okay? Now, of course, as, you, as we've just talked about, variation in a trait, in a phenotype, is determined both by genetic and environmental factors. Um, so if you, first thing you need to know is how much variation there is in a trait. For example, how much variation is there in hair color, height, or musical ability? And then how much genetic and environmental variation is there? So how much uh, environmental variation causes changes in hair color or height or musical ability? And heritability is this mathematical measure that estimates how much variation in a phenotype at a population level can be explained by variation in genetic relatedness. So do family members who share more genes in common um, have more similar hair color? Now, of course, variation in your undyed hair color is strongly determined by your amount of genetic relatedness. We would say that that has a high heritability because if you have red hair, your parents likely had red hair, right? That has a strong genetic component um, and people who are more related are more likely to have similar hair colors. Now, you're, you don't always have the same hair color as your parents, but it is high. In fact, it's higher than the amount of variation in height because, of course, variation in height is determined not just by genetic relatedness, right? If your parents are tall, you're likely to be taller, but it also is determined by the amount of nutrition available to you. So that has a moderate heritability. Lastly, let's take a look at an example with low heritability. So variation in musical ability is maybe a little bit related to genetic relatedness, but I would bet that actually most of your musical ability is determined by how much your parents encouraged you, um, how many music classes they were given to you. Um, maybe they were musicians themselves, so they were able to train you themselves. So that would say, we would say that musical ability has low heritability because most of the variation of musical ability is probably correlated with environmental factors, not with genetic factors. If heritability has a 100%, if it is equal to 100%, that means that all the variation in the trait can be explained by genetic variation. Huntington's disease is a great example of this. All the variation in Huntington's disease is determined by variation in a particular gene. If heritability is 0%, that either means that there's no variation in the trait, right? The trait doesn't vary at all or that all the variation in the trait can be explained by environmental differences, like the example of um, musical ability, which maybe isn't zero, but it's definitely closer to zero. Typically in psychology, what we see is that heritability estimates vary from 30 to 60%. Um, now, these numbers do not say that 30% of a trait is determined by the genes you have. That's not what heritability measures. Heritability is really just looking at, at a population level. In every one that we've looked at, um, how much of your abilities or your ability can be explained by differences in genes 
um, rather or by genetic relatedness. Okay, so it does not explain how much of your abilities are explained by genes themselves. One of the interesting things that we've seen is that genes and environment are often working together. And I'll give you an example of this, which from genetic imprinting, which says that some individuals, um, you always inherit two working copies, um, two working alleles from your parents, um, right? You get one from mom and one from dad. But interestingly enough, when genetic imprinting happens, your cells have silenced one of those alleles. So the copy from one parent is silenced during egg or sperm formation. This means you only have one working copy of that allele rather than two. A great example of this comes from the calico cat. Um, calico cats have particular cells where one of their um, X chromosomes has been silenced so that they get this modeled appearance, so that they only get one allele showing up. And in fact, you, the reason they have this modeled appearance, this particular color pattern, this tortoise shell appearance, is because in some cells, one allele is activated. In other cells, the other allele is activated. So this is basically the color that they got from both mom and dad, which results in this appearance. Some other examples of this, um, it, where we are silencing or activating um, genes, comes from work on epigenetics in rats. Um, so epigenetics is the study of the signals that activate or deactivate genes, right? So what environmental signals trigger these genes to be turned on or turned off? So in rats, maternal grooming behavior varies. So some female rats are high groomers and some female rats are low groomers. And um, females who um, raise high, who are high groomers and lick their rats a lot, um, their rat pups, those rat pups actually um, are better at dealing with stress. That high grooming behavior activates a glucocorticoid receptor, a stress hormone receptor um, gene um, that actually turns off the methyl groups from that gene. Those that having extra um, glucocorticoid receptors in their brain causes them to have lower stress responses. They're able to shut off their stress response really uh, quickly and they tend to be less anxious as adults. So just because they got licked a lot and groomed a lot by mom, they end up being better able to cope with stress as an adult. Low grooming females have the opposite. Because they don't groom their offspring frequently, those genes are not um, turned on, so they don't have a lot of glucocorticoid receptors in the brain. So this is a brain as uh, imaging from the inside of the brain looking at the number of glucocorticoid receptors. And you can see these are high levels of glucocorticoid receptors, and these are low levels. So low grooming moms um, have offspring who have high anxiety, high stress responses, because they're not able to turn off their stress response once it's activated. But this is not a genetic trait. Um, if you take rat pups from a low grooming mom and you raise them, you cross foster them, with another mom who's a high groomer, they develop that trait. Those rat pups become, um, they develop low stress responses and low anxiety, even though they themselves were these um, from low grooming environments. If you have any questions, send me an email.